Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. So, on your test, next class, you'll have to be able to determine whether or not a given series converges or diverges and justify your findings. So let's take a look at these first three. They're a great mixture of the different types of tests and things we might want to consider. So, in, when we're asked about absolute versus conditional convergence, I like to consider the absolute scenario first, right? And that way, if it does converge absolutely, I'm done. I know that it converges. If it converges absolutely, and I'm done. If it doesn't converge absolutely, then I'll go on and see if it converges conditionally. So let's go ahead and take a look at our first one. And to start off with that, I'll consider the absolute value of this series. So I'll consider the sum from 2 to infinity of absolute value of negative 1 to the n over natural log. And we know that that is. Simply the sum from 2 to infinity of, again, absolute value means that we're looking at 1 over dollar n. Okay, now this is easier to consider, right? For some reason, this looks a little bit more streamlined. I'm going to consider, right, a series that I know something about. Well, what looks similar to 1 over ln n? How about 1 over n? So I'm going to choose. And again, your index doesn't matter so much because we know that our comparison tests, right, require that our original function is greater than or less than, right, our comparison function for every n greater than or equal to n far out. But I'm still going to start at 2 so that we're starting at the same place. I'm going to choose 1 over n, the harmonic series. What do we know about the harmonic series 1 over n? Does that converge or diverge? Courtney? It diverges, right? So now let's consider the value of the nth term in my original, 1 over ln of n, versus the value of the nth term in the harmonic, 1 over n. Natural log of n is going to shrink my input. The natural log of 6 is less than 6 straight up. The natural log of 8 is less than 8 straight up. And so, because I'm making the denominator slightly smaller, overall fraction is larger. If I know the harmonic series diverges, and I can show that my original series is greater than or equal to my known divergent series for all n greater than or equal to n, I know then this must also diverge by direct comparison. However, we've considered the absolute value, so all this shows, right, is that the absolute value of the series does not converge, right? So it's not absolutely converging. So I'm going to go ahead and say uh, original. Which diverges. And then since original is greater than or equal to our comparison series, uh, So our original series is greater than or equal to our comparison series in the absolute. Therefore, right, our absolute value of the original diverges, so it does not converge absolutely. Wow, but it still could converge conditionally. So what do we do? Well, we're back to the original now. The original before we did absolute value. Does this converge? Uh, let's see. We have an alternating series, and so we'll go ahead and consider our three prereqs of pre with this for alternating series. <coughs> One. Do the terms alternate in sign? Yes. Two. Do the term values decrease in size? Yes. All right, 1 over ln n is going to be greater than 1 over ln 9 is going to be greater than, so our term values are decreasing in magnitude. And lastly, does the nth term approach 0 in the limit? Yes, the nth term shrinks to 0 as n goes to infinity. Therefore, all three requirements for alternating series tests are, are, um, are confirmed. Therefore, the series converges. But because it does not converge absolutely, we say it converges conditionally. Hey. So, wow, 
that was quite the analysis. So raise your hand if you had conditional convergence for number one on your own before you talked about it. That's great. That's great. All right, let's take a look at number two. First, we'll consider the absolute value of my original. So we'll consider the absolute value of the original. And in absolute value, oh, I forgot the end. All that does to the negative 1 to the end is change it to 1. So our absolute value now is 1. And then I get n over n cubed minus 1. Is n over n cubed minus 1 one of our familiar series? No, but I have an inkling of how this behaves, right? As n goes to infinity, I bet this behaves a lot like n over n cubed, which would be 1 over n squared, right? It's not the same, but it's going to behave like it in the limit. So I'm going to choose a comparison series. And I'm going to let the comparison series be 1 over n squared, because in the limit, I bet my original right <coughs> behaves like this. Sorry, I bet the absolute value of the original behaves like this. OK, so what does this comparison series do? What does the sum of 1 over n squared do? Sophia? Converges, right? This converges by p series. My comparison by p series test, that exponent is greater than one, so this comparison series is guaranteed to converge. All right. Uh, so let's go ahead and see if we can use direct comparison. In order to use direct comparison, right, and show convergence, I need my original to be less than or equal to my comparison series. Is n over n cubed minus 1 going to be less than or equal to 1 over n squared for all n greater than n? Oh, crikey. If it had been plus 1 on the bottom, my denominator would have been slightly larger, ensuring the overall value of the fraction would be slightly less than my comparison. And then I could use direct comparison to show convergence. So once again, direct comparison, if my original is greater than a diverging, then my original diverges. Direct comparison, if my original is less than a converging, then converges by direct comparison. But if my original is slightly greater than a converging series, I can't use direct comparison. That's OK. I can use limit comparison. That gets right around it. So I'll use limit comparison test with because I think it's going to behave like 1 over n squared. So I'll use limit comparison test. So let's do a limit comparison where we'll consider the limit as n goes to infinity of original series over comparison series. So my original in, a, in the absolute value is n over n cubed minus 1. And then dividing by my comparison 1 over n squared is the same as multiplying by n squared over 1. So. Algebraically, my expression becomes n times n squared is n cubed over n cubed minus 1. And we see then that a dominant on top, n cubed, over a dominant on bottom, n cubed, in the limit is going to be 1. This is a constant, right? It's a positive constant between 0 and infinity, which just means that they share the same fate. If my comparison series, comparison series converges, then now my original series must also Converge, And because it was the absolute value of the original, it converges absolutely. Now, we can do L'Hopital's rule, but I see that's going to take three times. So much quicker, in my opinion, right, algebraically to show that, is to multiply by 1 over n cubed. Then we can see the algebraic evaluation of this becomes 1 over 1 minus 1 over n cubed. 1 over n cubed, and then goes to infinity, goes to 0 equals 1. And that's a constant, so they share it. Uh, that doesn't equal 0, it equals C for constant. C. Constant. So they share the same fate. So converges 
by limit comparison. And because it was the absolute value of the original, converges absolutely. Woo. So who got com converges absolutely for number two? Did you get that already? Hey, that's good. So we've got a distinction between conditional convergence versus absolute convergence and we're one to go. I can consider the absolute value of the term as we've done in the first two. However, right away I notice that this is an n squared on top and an n plus one quantity squared. And so if I were to expand the denominator, my dominant on top would be an n squared. My dominant on bottom would be an n squared in the limit, right? Does the term value approach zero? No, in the limit, the term value is going to approach one, positive or negative. Now that will alternate, right? That will alternate, but it's going to alternate between one, negative one, one, negative one, one, negative one. So the limit of the nth term does not exist, right? It does not exist. Therefore, it does not equal zero, which is a requirement for any series to converge. The limit of the, of the nth term must be zero. So because the nth term does not approach zero, this series diverges by the nth term test without having to consider absolute value or conditional convergence. So you can save yourself time and energy if you apply the nth term test right off the bat. But you, in order to do that, you've got to recognize you've got an n squared dominant over an n squared dominant. You guys see that? Okay. So we recognize by the nth term test The limit as n goes to infinity of my original series does not exist. And since it does not exist, it does not equal zero. And if the nth limit of the nth term doesn't equal zero, then the original diverges by the nth term test. Two. Awesome. So who got diverges for number three? Get diverges? That's good. What questions are you having about the first three? All right. And so, right, testing the convergence of your knowledge about convergence is these finding the interval of convergence. For what values of x does a particular power series converge absolutely? For what values of x does it converge conditionally, right? Or does it diverge entirely? So let's take a look at this one, number four. I like this problem because it puts everything together. It includes a, uh, a power series, right, with x and independent variable. It includes absolute convergence and conditional convergence. And so we've got a lot of things going on here. All right, so what's our tool? Which test is our tool for determining an interval of convergence for a general power series? What's our test? Marissa? Ratio test. Yes, the ratio test. Good. So we'll go ahead and do the ratio test already with the absolute value built in, and that will automatically give us any values of x for which the series converges absolutely right off the bat. So we'll apply the ratio test. Consider the limit as n goes to infinity <coughs> of the absolute value of n plus first term. That would be x minus 3 to the n plus 1 over 2 times quantity n plus 1 divided by the nth term, a sub n. Well, that's going to be multiplied by the reciprocal, so that's going to be 2n over x minus 3 for the n. I'm going to write down the fly ratio test. For this one. And this will determine for what values of x the series converges absolutely, if any. All right, so now let's go ahead and do some algebra. I know that this is given by the limit as n goes to infinity. I'll grab onto my n terms and put them out front. You don't have to, but I like to put them out front so I don't trip on them. I get 2n over 2 times quantity n plus 1 is 2n plus 2. And then I got absolute value of, and I'll bring down one of these x minus 3s times x minus 3 to the n over x minus 3 to the n is 1 x minus 3 left. Looking for you I've ever seen. And then we get everybody. We've got our 2n. We've got our 2n plus 1 right here that I expanded. We have 1x minus 3 remaining on top after canceling out nx minus 3s on bottom. Are you guys good? Yes? So we know, right, 
that the n portion of this, as n goes to infinity, has dominant top of 2n, has dominant bottom of 2n, what will this fraction approach as n goes to infinity? 1, right? According to L'Hopital's rule, this is 2 over 2, which goes to 1, which means that in order for this to converge, absolutely, I need x minus 3, right? Absolute value of x minus 3 to be less than 1. Does that ever happen? Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. We know that in between negative 1 is less than x minus 3 is less than 1. Adding 3 to all three columns gives us 2 is less than x is less than 4. So on this interval, strictly 2 to 4, we have absolute convergence. So in between 2 and 4, we've got absolute convergence. How do I know that's absolute convergence? Because we did the absolute value in the ratio test. So these are the values that we got out for absolute convergence. However, we could still have conditional convergence at the endpoints. So what will we do? To check the endpoints, we'll grab onto 2 and put it into my original series definition and see what series results. Then we'll consider our convergence or divergence of that particular series. So let's first check 2. We'll go ahead and let x equal 2. At x equals 2, my original series becomes 2 minus 3 is negative 1 to the n over 2n. And still from 1 to infinity. Okay, so we've got negative 1 to the n over 2n. Does this converge or diverge? Well, we can consider the absolute value of this expression, right, to see if we converge absolutely. We know that we converge absolutely in between 2 and 4. We could still converge absolutely at 2. When we plug in 2, all right, here, if I take the absolute value, I get 1 over 2n. Does 1 over 2n converge? No, that's half of the harmonic. That diverges, right? That diverges by P-series test, or it's half of the harmonic. And so this does not converge in absolute value, but it could still converge, right? How could it still converge? It could converge if we satisfy the requirements of alternating series because I've got that negative 1 to the end. So this does not converge absolutely, but I've got alternating terms. Check. I've got terms decrease in magnitude. Yes, as n right increases, then the value of the fraction decreases forever after. And is the limit of the nth term zero? Yes, the value of the nth term will approach zero as n goes to infinity. So at x equals two, the series converges by alternating series, but because it diverged right in the absolute, then that is conditional convergence at x equals two. So conditional convergence at x equals two. Conditional convergence at x equals 2. One more to check, you guys, and then we're done. So at x equals, what else do we still have to consider? Vivian? x equals 4, so let's try x equals 4. Then my original series, thank you, becomes 4 minus 3 is 1 to the n. n equals 1 to infinity of 1 to the n over 2n. 1 to the n is forever going to be 1. So I don't have to write that 1 to the n. And I get half the harmonic series. This diverges by P series in the absolute, in the conditional, everything. This diverges. And so in my original interval of convergence, I would write right square brackets around negative 1 all the way up until excluded parentheses on the 4. Absolute only in between, conditional at x equals left endpoint, but converges still. So in my interval of convergence, I get two bracket before parentheses. So what do I need to do? I still need to finish saying this 
5 version is by P-series. So we have converges on 2, 2, 4 parentheses and conditional convergence at x equals 2. Very good. Awesome. Did anybody get all the way to the end? Yeah, you got the brackets <laughs> and the parentheses. That's awesome. So this kind of puts it all together, right? So this is a, this, I like problems like this because it kind of puts it all together. The first part of your review is these kinds of problems. Cool. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording. We'll take care of our OTL check. So you're going to have a big chunk of time to work and review as you prepare for our unit six test next class. I wanted to point out some things, but I think we discussed this during bell work, right? If the series converges in the absolute, right, then we say it converges absolutely, and that implies convergence. We know that if a series does not converge absolutely, but it still converges, right, typically by alternating series tests, then we have a conditionally converging series. Who cares? Well, because I erase those. Because only an absolutely convergent series could be rearranged, the terms could be rearranged into any order, and you would not affect the value of the sum, right, of those terms. That is, the series value would still converge to the same finite value if it's absolutely convergent, no matter the order of the terms. That's not the case, as we saw last class, with a conditionally convergent series. A conditionally convergent series, we talked about a scenario where we could rearrange the terms to make it diverge. So here we started with a convergent series. All we did was change the order of the terms, and suddenly, right, it diverges. Well, what allowed us to do that was the fact that we had alternating signs and that we had um, that we had an infinite, an infinite series, an infinite number of terms. And so if we had a finite series, then we wouldn't be able to change a convergent series into a divergent series. It was just the fact that we had an infinite series that would make this possible. We also looked at a scenario where we could take a conditionally convergent series, take the terms and rearrange them so that the sum of the series was equal to any particular value we chose, like e, right, or pi, or ln of 17. We could do that again because it was infinite and we continued grabbing positive terms until we go slightly above our desired sum, and then negative terms until we go slightly below, and then positive terms until we go slightly above again. But because our term values are decreasing in magnitude, we can construct it so that we oscillate back and forth in our partial sums closer and closer to that predetermined value. Since the limit of the partial sums exists and equals that value, then the overall series converges to that value. And that's an important connection. Remember, in order for a series to converge, the limit of the partial sums has to converge. All right. So I think that that does it for our discussion. Oh, I wanted to see if we can list all, all the convergence tests on our own. Uh, Marissa and I were talking about the flow chart, and I didn't find really a better one. And so everybody, you can direct your attention during today's review time to page 532 and there's a little bubble pop-up video bubble flow chart that you can use to aid your discussion. There are a couple of things that we didn't do because they're not on the College Boards course outline and that includes the um, the root test. We didn't do the root test but that's pretty simple. You can check that out if you want to do that to show up on the flow chart but we didn't do the root test because it's not called for. We also didn't do telescoping series because that's not called for. Uh, either. We just stuck to what was on the BC topic outline uh, this first time around, but you can check out that flow chart on page 532. All right, it's time for round robin. Get ready because I'm going to call on you. We're going to see if we can come up with a list of convergence tests. Let's think about everything that we've done thus far. So what's one test for convergence? Any order doesn't matter. Riley. P-series test. P-series test. And what is a P series test in a nutshell? Kobe? Uh, so if the exponent on the end on the bottom is one or less, that diverges, it's greater than one. Absolutely. And so right here, if my exponent on a generalized inverse power function, one over n to the P, if P is greater than one, we've got convergence. If it's less than or equal to one, then it's diverged. It's good. Thank you, guys. What's another test? Any order? Courtney? Ratio test. Ratio test. An all-powerful ratio test. And what 
does the ratio test ask us to consider? Danny? If the term after the end term is less than the end term. Yes. In the absolute value. Absolutely. If the limit of the n plus first term to the nth term, if this ratio is less than one, then the series converges. If it's greater than one, the series diverges. What happens if it's equal to one? Inconclusive. It doesn't mean that it converges. It doesn't mean that it diverges. It just means it's inconclusive and you have to use a different test. Good. What's a different test besides ratio and p-series? All those are two of my favorite. Grace? The limit test, and we've got limit comparison. The limit comparison test, we're counting this as our closure, by the way, for the September 15th. The limit comparison test asks us to compare a known series with an original. As n goes to infinity, we can compare our original a sub n with some known series, call it b sub n. What if that equals? A constant, right? A constant between zero and infinity. What does that tell you about your two series? Sophia? That they have the same thing that the same Yeah, they have the same fate. They either both converge or they both diverge. So if we equal C, then they share the same fate. That could mean that they both diverge. Okay? P series ratio limit comparison. Are there any of the other tests that we used? Emily? Alternating series. Alternating series tests. Good. For our alternating series tests. series test, we had three requirements. And so, <laughs> I know what I'm going to call it. Marissa, what are three requirements? Terms alternate in sign. Good. Uh, decrease in magnitude. Yes. And then um, limit goes to zero. Yep, the nth term approaches zero in the limit. Absolutely. Good job. So we've got alternating series, ratio pieces. Are there any other hiding out there that we haven't done? Vivian? Yeah, the integral test. If we have a positive decreasing continuous function, right, that has the same value as my terms, right, we can model the behavior of my series with a function and then consider the integral over the same, right, over the same domain, the integral, if the integral exists, right, and is a, a finite value, then the original series converges if the integral does not exist, then the series diverges. So we've got integral tests. Okay, we have a lot. So if the integral diverges, then the series diverges. If the integral converges, then the series converges. And for that reason, I'll go ahead and do a share same fate again. In order to do that, though, my, seri uh, my, my function has to be positive and decreasing. It has to be positive and decreasing. And we're missing one big one, All right, Courtney? Direct comparison. Direct comparison, good. So direct comparison test works for both convergence and divergence. But if you're going to use direct comparison for convergence, your original has to be less than or equal to create your comparison series. If you're going to use direct comparison to show divergence, then your original must be greater than or equal to your comparison series. Direct comparison, awesome. Understand. What are we missing? Oh, we were, we were missing divergence, right? It, by nth term test is the easiest and quickest, most direct way to show divergence. The nth term test cannot be used to show convergence, right? It's just a necessary prerequisite in order for a series to converge. The limit of the nth term must go to zero. But it's very quick to show divergence. If the nth term does not approach zero, then automatically the series diverges and you can stop by nth term test. Right, so we'll include that. That's a good one. Awesome.
Now I really think we have them all. Yes? Yes? Awesome. Let's go ahead and close it up. We already did number two. So we did number two. What's the quickest way to determine the divergence of the series? Speak of the devil. So what's the quickest way to show divergence? Kobe? And term test, comma, baby. If the value of the nth term does not approach zero in the limit, then the series automatically diverges. Our test for convergence we just listed in detail. And lastly, which test is used to determine the interval of convergence for a general power series? So which test do we go to if we want to determine an interval of convergence? Sophia? Ratio. Yeah, the ratio test is our go-to tool for that. Awesome, you guys. Great work. So we're going to go ahead and do our units. Six scan check. Then we've got our OTL. <coughs> I'm going to go ahead and go back to the stamps and then I'll leave this up. But I'm going to stop the recording so that we can take care of our stamp business. Good job.